Hello, and welcome to Candidates Up Front. This is a public interest election program of Berks Community Television and the League of Women Voters of Berks County. I'm Judith Cranus, a member of the League. Our November 8th election is coming up, and we will be voting this time for federal and state officials. The deadline to register is October 24th, but if you're not registered, please do so now. Now, the League is interviewing candidates, those who agreed to be interviewed, in the contested races. And for each race, the candidates will get the same basic questions and will have the same amount of time to answer them. Now, we're talking today about the 126th Pennsylvania House of, House of Representatives, and there are two candidates competing, Democrat Mark Rossi and Republican James D. Oswald. This district includes Laureldale, Mount Penn, Muhlenberg, Lower Alsace, St. Lawrence, parts of the city of Reading, and Exeter townships. Now, state representatives serve a two-year term in the state legislature in Harrisburg. They initiate legislation and vote to create laws. They pass the budget, including taxes and expenditures of the state. They help constituents with issues regarding state government. The salary for a state representative is $90,335 per year, plus benefits and expenses. Now, please remember, the views expressed in this interview are those of the candidate and not the opinions of the League of Women Voters or Berks Community Television. Our interview today is with Mark Rossi. Welcome, Mr. Rossi. Thank you, Judith, and thank the League of Women Voters for having me today. We're delighted. Would you tell our viewers, please, about yourself and why you are running? Sure. Um, I'm Mark Rossi. I'm a resident of Muhlenberg Township. I graduated from Muhlenberg High School and also Kutztown University. So I'm a local boy here to Berks County. Um, this is uh, my fifth term. I'm currently in office and I uh, decided to run in 2012 to uh, not only uh, help educate but protect our children in this commonwealth as victims of sexual abuse. I wanted to go in and, and make a difference in the lives of uh, our children. And in 2019, I actually had Governor Wolf come to Muhlenberg High School and sign uh, my house bill into law, which um, actually changed the statute of limitations uh, for our children um, that were sexually abused. Um, and it, it's probably one of the greatest pieces of legislation um, that I've worked with since being in office. And um, I just love uh, fighting for the people. I love being a fair representative. Um, I view every piece of legislation that comes in front of me uh, equally from both sides. And the one thing I definitely don't like is lobbyists. And I can assure my constituents that uh, I vote uh, the people in my district, not uh, what a lobbyist tells me or, or, or the money that they give out to so many representatives out there, which is just sick. Um, so I, I just believe I'm open-minded and fair. Thank you. Now, you are a Democrat. That's correct. What draws you to your party? Um, I, I think the, the thing I, I like most about Democrats, and sometimes I tell people, though, if you look at my voting record, sometimes you can't tell what I am because um, I vote all over the place. But I, I love the inclusiveness of the Democratic Party. Um, they really are out there working for the, the working uh, man or woman. Um, they're out there protecting women's rights. Um, it's just a party that um, doesn't put out their hand first and ask how much money can you give me before we make a decision. And I think that's the most important thing to me. Are there things about your party that you're not comfortable with? Sure. Uh, there are things that, um, you know, I'm a pro-business uh, representative. I sit on the finance committee and sometimes um, the, the norm of the Democratic Party is maybe to tax businesses more where um, I actually voted for the corporate net income tax uh, reduction this year. Um, I, I believe that if we could lower things like that, we could draw more businesses into Pennsylvania. And sometimes my party, uh, and this happens on both sides, that my party tends to go too far left, and we have a lot of uh, representatives on the other side that go too far right. I'm more of a centrist, and um, I'm willing to, to listen to all uh, policy ideas that come in front of me. Mm -hmm. Now, you've mentioned this a little bit, but we're going to go over it some more. Um, in the General Assembly, your party always wants you to vote the party line, and the people who voted for you want you to vote their view, and people who did not for, vote for you still expect you to represent them, and you probably have your own ideas. 
So how do you balance these expectations? Tell us your thinking process. Um, I'm very fortunate because um, my party doesn't expect me to vote the party line here in, in Pennsylvania. In fact, um, I'm not always with the party. I don't get reprimanded for it. Um, it's actually um, something that I really enjoy with my leadership. I just let them know where I stand on the issue. I think it's important that we view every piece of legislation and policy that comes in front of us um, not a matter of left to right, but what is best for my district. So I know that there are some leaders out there that, you know, they want you to stay in line. But I'm very fortunate because I have voted against my party uh, multiple times without repercussions, and I will continue to do so. At the end of the day, for me, it's what's best for the people of the 126th district. Mm -hmm. Now, on the first day of the legislation of the legislative session, you're at to pr uh, approve the rules for conducting business. And these rules allow committee chairs, who represent only 17 percent of Pennsylvanians, to block legislation even if the majority of legislators support it. Should these rules stay as they are, or should these rules be changed? Well, uh, of course these rules should be changed. Um, the rank and file member really doesn't have a say, unfortunately, in how this happens. Um, when they decide on the rules, it's basically the majority party, which is a Republican in the House right now, and they say, these are the rules of the House, we have the votes for it, and this is the way it's going to be. Now, the only way those rules are going to change, unfortunately, is when the Democrats, uh, hopefully, um, you know, because of redistricting that just happened, maybe we can get the majority back in the House, and we can turn to a system that's maybe more fair but for right now, the um, majority party controls the rules. Now, the committee process is just, just horrid. When one person has control over any piece of legislation that comes out, it is absolutely unfair and it shouldn't, uh, it's a process that doesn't work because there are so many good pieces of legislation that get stuck in committee because the lobbyists paying off chairman. It's got to stop. Um, it's Going back in, in ancient history, maybe, but when the Democrats were in control, didn't they have the same kind of system? Wasn't it the same kind of a few people setting those rules? Yeah, that's pretty much been the standard in the House of Representatives and the Senate, not only in Pennsylvania, but all across the nation. Majority party that's in control want to make sure that whatever comes out of their committee um, is really is pushed out by the chairman. Now, we do have other processes in place to move legislation out, but it, it's it's a process, It's and, and believe me, I've been part of it, because when the, the chairman wouldn't move my child abuse legislation out, uh, we had to work, do workarounds to try to get that out. And that's a process that the majority party is always going to have. So it's, there's no hope to, to get out of under that few controlling everything that happens. I think the, the one of the benefits that we have seen is with redistricting, we're going to get a fair process. Now, um, because we had a majority of Republicans um, through uh, gerrymandered districts, and, and now we have um, what might be considered fairer districts, that there might be more of a consensus to move pieces out, and we won't have to um, go above and beyond the chairman. Hopefully, uh, the process that will be set up from this redistricting is, is a more fair process. Good. Uh, lately, to get around the governor's pen, the legislature has written constitutional amendments to be voted on in primary elections, which have low turnout. In the long run, do you feel it's appropriate to enshrine in our state constitution things that are normally handled legislatively? This is something I have a great deal of, <laughs> that I've worked with uh, because because when the Senate didn't want to move um, my bill uh, that would create the retroactive window for child abuse victims, um, the Senate decided to go in a constitutional amendment process way where I believe that it could have just been done statutorily. Now, a lot of the constitutional amendments that have just been proposed by the Republican majority all should go through a statutory process where, um, you know, this is why we're elected, the members of the House and Senate, to make these tough decisions um, instead of um, putting every question that the governor won't sign for them on the ballot. It, it, it's it's um, these these um, questions do not be, do not belong enshrined in our constitution. They belong in, in a statutorily type of form where we can go in there and change them very easily. So um, it's a process that um, the majority party is using right now 
to just get around the governor's veto. And uh, I'm hoping that Pennsylvanians, um, that if these questions do get on the ballot, come out and, and make the correct vote and end this process. Okay. Now, everyone that I know is <clears throat> pro-life, but everybody means something different by it. Ending gun violence is pro-life, preventing climate change, protecting endangered species, being against abortion, being in favor of choice on abortion, universal health care, ending the death penalty, all pro-life. On which of these issues or other issues do you consider yourself pro-life? Well, I mean, normally I would just consider myself pro-life, period. But on some of these specific areas that we're talking about today, and I think the number one issue that's on this paper is, is of course, abortion. Um, uh, now, I would answer it in a way that, you know, m me, myself, I, I probably would never get an abortion. But again, I represent my constituents, and my constituents are over overwhelmingly pro-choice. And, uh, you know, Statute 8 18, Chapter 32, the Abortion Control Act, um, I support. Uh, it's something that I believe that um, that women uh, deserve to have that um, safe health care. Um, you know, I support the process uh, that a woman should have an abortion up to uh, the end of the 23rd week. And I also support that, you know, past that 23rd week, if a woman um, is uh, suffering some type of health care problem, that she should still be able to get an abortion. I only believe, though, that government should only support abortions, um, and meaning uh, giving money, when uh, a woman or a girl is raped or there's incest. I don't believe government should be paying for abortions. But um, it, it's going to be a topic that, again, one of these constitutional amendments could come up and the people will have a chance to vote on. I'm hoping that, um, that the people of Pennsylvania will stand with women and, and stand to protect uh, abortion here. And the other one of the issues that, that we talked about here is the death penalty. I am pro-death penalty as well. Um, I believe that, um, especially in crimes where cops are being killed, that um, we need to have that tool available to us. Um, to, it's, it's basically an eye for an eye. Now, pregnancy is not benign. In the United States, for every 100,000 pregnant women, 23.8 die during or soon after pregnancy. And this is much, much higher than other developed nations. And it especially hits minority women and rural women. Does Pennsylvania have a responsibility to provide more support to pregnant women to prevent these deaths? Yes, that's a great question, um, because absolutely. There's no doubt that uh, we could appropriate more funds um, for this specifically. And, um, you know, our women, um, you know, that, um, they raise our children. They deserve um, to be taken care of, whether it's during pregnancy or after pregnancy. Um, they're really shaping the minds of our little children and, and on, on the forefront of raising our kids. So um, we should be doing everything possible to make sure that they're healthy. And would that include things like a Family Leave Act or? Absolutely, 100% I would support that. That's, that's, to me, that's just common sense. How about funding for rural hospitals? Uh, again, um, why we wouldn't makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, we should be putting, especially after the, what COVID did to our hospitals um, and all the nurses that we see leaving, um, we should be doing everything we can to be injecting all types of new appropriations in the hospitals to make sure they're up and running. They're actually doing more uh, for men, women in, in each county. Um, but again, we're seeing a situation with nurses right now that that m nurses are leaving the workforce and we should be dumping as much money as, as we can, even in the education. Something simple as edu educating, uh, maybe putting a grant in place where um, if they go to study to become a nurse that there's maybe a $10,000 grant per year. I mean, that's just something that uh, to me, again, is common sense if we want to continue the great health care that we do have in this commonwealth. Thank you. The Pennsylvania legislature recently voted to spend $20 million, $20 million to help religious institutions and schools add security to their buildings. While the money is most appreciated, with every invention of another, women, another weapon, we need to up the security around that. And I'm missing a page of my notes here, so I'm... There we go. Gun violence costs the United States $557 billion annually. For perspective, that's more than 10 times Pennsylvania's annual budget. 
and its police, ambulances, hospital emergency rooms, and ongoing care for the wounded. These costs add to inflation. What can the legislature do to increase gun violence and reduce the cost to taxpayers and to the companies that provide health insurance to their employees? Um, I think I want to just go back to the first part of that question is the security of our schools. When I meet with superintendents, I mean, that's part of the um, discussion number two right after mental health of the students and the severity that we're seeing that issue right now. But uh, security is a, is a great concern to our superintendents, not only in Berks County, but across our state. The one thing that we want to do is make sure that when our children go to school, that they're safe. And um, we are appropriating all kinds of different type of monies out there to put new glass in place, new doors in place. But again, like you said, Judith, is that ever going to be enough to stop this ridiculous uh, type of gun violence that's going on um, not only in Berks County but across our nation? And you know, the one thing that you know we can continue to do is is um, consistent and, and good background checks. And there's probably more, especially like with this ghost gun situation that's going on right now that our great attorney general has been fighting. I mean, that, that kind of nonsense just has to stop, and we've got to put an end to it. And the, the one thing I really see uh, in, in Harrisburg, you know, we have a, a, a powerful gun lobby up there. And, you know, um, if, if we could be focusing on... Um, red flag laws uh, to stop some of these predators out there. But again, teaching our children that guns is not the answer uh, to, um, to um, hurting other children. I mean, this is something that we need to be starting from a very early age um, and give them better tools uh, instead of having them turn to violence and using guns to, to whether they're um, you know, attacking schools or attacking just the regular person on the street. Mm -hmm. Berks County is 50% agricultural, and we know that our growing seasons have changed. So far this summer, Pennsylvania was spared the massive destruction of wildfires and floods occurring in some states, but storms are more destructive and we have drought. Should Pennsylvania do more to protect our economy by doing more to protect climate change? And what actions do you think the legislature should or shouldn't take? Right. Berks County is uh, a great agricultural county. I mean, right now we have over 800 farms in Berks County. They deal with greenhouses, trees, sod, poultry, eggs, and milk. And actually, we're the second uh, largest in the state here in Berks County. So um, I'm really proud of the agricultural work that we do here. But, you know, to the second part of that question is, that, is about climate change. And, and climate change is real. And there's so many things that we need to do with the environment. And um, the, I think the key has always been about finding renewable uh, resources out there, energy, and that's, of course, solar and wind, and, and not many people think about tidal as where a lot of countries out there are, are using the ocean and the waves to create electricity. So um, we have to reduce our carbon emissions. That's just uh, um, something that has to be done. And I actually voted um, in one of the bills in the House um, to reduce carbon emissions. But there's so much more that, that we can still do out there. Um, I think uh, something that's been, um, that really bothers me is our, our, is our plastic uh, pollution that, that's going on. We create so much, so many plastics and they're ending up in our oceans and um, there's things that we need to do to, to clean that up and we could actually use wood to replace some of those. So um, it, it's something that we really need, gotta take a real focus on. We know the seas are, are gonna continue to rise. We see the, the polar caps continue to melt. And if we don't, I know that we're gonna probably have uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, a possibility of oceans rising another two, three feet. No, we're gonna have to shorten the answers a little bit to make <laughs> sure we get through all the questions. I'll try my best. Okay, <laughs> the, the state budget contains large increases for educational funding this year, but it's a one year thing. We have 500 school districts in Pennsylvania, most which rely heavily on the property tax because the legislature has not agreed to a long-range plan for school funding. And we have charter schools that pull $2.6 billion from the public schools' budgets. Some say Pennsylvania's charter school law doesn't provide the transparency and accountability that is required of our public schools. 
So two quick questions. What is your view on how Pennsylvania funds both public schools and charter schools, and do we need charter school reform? Sure. Um, you know, a couple of years back, we, we changed the law and um, using the Fair Funding Formula Act, and the unfortunate problem is that only new money that would go uh, to that uh, that we would put up um, from uh, the legislature, and, and it would go out to the, the schools, and it, and it allowed more money to go out to some of these more distressed school districts, and that's, that's great. I would love to see all money that we use to fund our public schools go through that fair funding formula. And we would see school districts like the ones I represent, Reading and Muhlenberg um, and Antietam get more money and Exeter. Um, and that's the key. Now charter schools, um, you know, there is very little transparency. They're getting the full amount of per pupil dollar and there's no brick and mortar. And um, we see them advertising. We don't advertise for our public schools in Pennsylvania, and we, there's actually a law against it, uh, but there, that lo same law should be in place because they are pulling more kids out of our public schools, having them go into cyber charter or charter, and it, it's got to stop. And, and um, there's so, many, so much reform that we can do, but I can tell you right now, one of the biggest things that stopped that reform is lobbyists writing big checks to some of the members of the majority party and uh, we're talking twenty-five, fifty thousand dollar checks, and then they vote to protect charter school reform. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania is one of nine states with closed primary elections, and the primary is the spring election when the main parties, the Democrats and Republicans, choose their candidates. Research has shown that states with open primaries have more moderate or centrist candidates, while states with closed primaries have candidates who are more radical, either to the right or the left. Should Pennsylvania change how we run our primary elections? I can answer this very quickly for you, and I, and I do. I believe that we should have open primaries. Somebody like myself, who I believe I'm a centrist, that I could vote to what I think is best for my district on whatever side of the aisle it is. And you're right. This, when you have these closed primaries, you're getting more radical Republicans in. You're getting way left liberals in. So. Um, it should, those people that are independent should be able to come and vote for a candidate in the primary. And I'm not sure why uh, my colleagues on the Hill are so afraid of that. Thank you. Now, compared to other states, and you have addressed this already, Pennsylvania has rather weak laws on campaign finance mm. limits and enforcement. And there are loopholes in the disclosure laws that apply to lobbyists. Lawmakers aren't banned from making, taking gifts. Do you feel these neat laws need to be strengthened? Or are Pennsylvania's laws fine for Pennsylvania? And let's give that 30 seconds since you've sure. already talked about it. Um, yeah, I mean, lobbyists have too much control over some of my colleagues up there. And there's so much dark money that's out there. Um, we, we should know where it's coming from, but unfortunately, we, we can. And as a lawmaker, I'll never take a gift. Um, and they were actually just up there the other day, um, constituents from all over Pennsylvania asking us to pass the gift ban. And our, our Republican majority party just basically looked the other way and, and did, did nothing. And that just has got to stop. I mean, um, m there's too much money in play in politics. We, we need to be representing people, not companies, uh, not institutions. Pennsylvania's election law is out of date. In the past three years, there has been hastily made legislative changes that didn't wake, work out the way some legislators thought they would. We've had disagreements, court suits, on how these hastily written laws should be interpreted. We've lost election officials because the job became so stressful due to constant changes. Certainly, there is a more reasonable way to bring our election code up to date. What kinds of changes, if any, would you like to see to our election code? And let's take a minute. Okay, well, we definitely have heard from um, county uh, election officials across Pennsylvania, and it's been the same. They've been asking um, to pre-canvas those ballots before they come in, um, drop boxes, and, I mean, it's been the same from every election official across the state. And unfortunate, the, the, the majority party refuses uh, to pass any of those pieces of legislation. They're kind of on their own path of that they want to restrict voting as much as possible. They don't want drop boxes. They want voter ID. Um, they, they, they absolutely keep lying about the last election, about the fraud that has happened, and they can't even prove that there was any fraud. So um, we need to do everything in our power to have people actually go out there and vote. Mail-in voting 
works. It has worked out in Oregon and Washington where that's all they do. And in Pennsylvania here, there's people who um, are older or who just can't make it to, to the ballot, to the vote that day. And by mail-in voting, they actually get more time to go over the candidates. So it, it's something that we need to address. And I'm hoping that at some point our colleagues get to that point. Thank you. Um, we're talking last about inflation and founding father Alexander Hamilton set up the Federal Reserve Bank to set monetary policy. It's not in the Constitution, but it is the driving force in handling inflation. Um, that said, the legislature probably can't solve inflation, but should it consider the inflationary or deflationary aspects of the bills it considers? And we'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, thank you, Judith. Of course, uh, and, and controlling inf inflation is very difficult. There's not just one thing that we can pull trigger on and, and then it's going to work, uh, especially if you're in business, you know, and, and you see how uh, products are being shipped in from all over this country. I mean, are there things that we could do to support um, ships that are coming in and unloading and making sure those docks are staying open all the time. That's nothing that we can do here in Pennsylvania. But we can pass certain laws to keep um, prices on the rise or, or give special industry grants to keep their costs lower. Thank you. And that gives you about 15 seconds for a close. Sorry, it's so short. That's okay. <laughs> I, I, listen, uh, the only thing I want my constituents to know is that I'm always going to do what's in their best interest. I'm not here to serve myself. I'm here to serve the people, and it's been my greatest honor serving the people of the 126th District. Thank you, Mr. Rossi. And viewers, please remember there is another candidate for the 24th PA, PA dis, the, excuse me, the 126th PA House District, James D. Oswald. And you can see that interview on BCTV's website or YouTube page. To check your voting status, go to votepa.gov, and I believe we have a slide for that. You can register, change your party, locate your polling place, or apply for an absentee or mail-in ballot. The deadline to register is October 24th. The deadline to apply for a mail-in ballot is November 1st. Then, check the League's online voter guide, vote411.org to confirm your new district and get more information on the candidates. Or you can contact Berks County Election System Services. Thank you for watching Candidates Up Front. I'm Judith Cranus. Good day.